Greetings and good evening, St. George North. If someone had told me when I was growing up just down the road there at Walker's that one day I'd be standing on a political platform about to give a speech supporting a candidate in a by-election here, I would have said, no way, brother. And that's not going to happen in a million years. Because I grew up in a house where I saw elective politics firsthand, up close. I saw my father and my grandfather, or well, my father and his father before him, give everything they had to their party and their country, whether they were in government or in opposition. And that took a toll. The family pays a toll. And in the case of my father, well, he gave everything, but everything was taken from him early. That was not something I wanted for myself. I didn't want to put my own family through that. And yet, here I am tonight. And up until 10 minutes ago, I wondered how did this happen? <laughs> but if you know Mia Motley, and she asks you to do something, it's hard to refuse. But I want to start with a story that set me on this route. You know, every morning, most mornings, in fact, my father would take me to school. And we would leave walkers just there, go down the road, pass, go down Gun Hill, pass the Glebe, pass the church, and get down towards Charles Road Bridge. One morning we did that, and there was a group of men there, and they recognized the car. And one of them stood up, he smiled, and he came to talk to my father. My father rolled down the window and smiled and waited to see what this man had to say. And a guy came over and he said, Skipper, how are you doing? You know I vote for you. I want to continue voting for you, but things are a little soft right now. Please give me some, give me some cash, give me some dollars. I can tell you the smile fell right off my father's face. And those who knew him, and I see Cynthia Ford sitting right here below the stage. When I say the smile fell off his face and a look of stone came over it. I think Cynthia will know what I'm talking about. And he looked right at the man and he said, you got the wrong fella. I'm not that kind of man. He rolled up the window and the car sped off. And still the stony look was on his face and I'm sitting in that car wondering why things feel a little bit tense. Does the old man really know what he's doing? You know, I must have been all of 14. I wonder what he had just done. And after a while, I said to him, Daddy, aren't you afraid that you just left some votes back there at Charles Road Bridge? And he paused. He looked at me. He looked back at the road. And he said, you know, Roddy, when I was about your age, I saw the same thing happen to my father. Only difference was the man my father refused cursed him up and down the road. And I asked my father the same thing. And he turned to me and he said, Tom, this is not the first time I get cursed. This is not going to be the last time I get cursed. But I noticed something about these people who curse and abuse me when I don't give them money. They still come to my public meetings. And I see them sometimes right in the front row cheering as loud as anybody in the crowd. Boy, I thought about that story a long time. And it told me important things about my father and his father and the rich tradition in politics that we have in this country. Serious politicians talk policy. They talk about manifestos, crafting policy, winning arguments, having a battle of ideas in the political domain. They put a manifesto to the electorate hoping that they will win. And when they do, they set a course, they chart a path, and they ask the electorate to stay that course. Now, you've heard that from Prime Minister Mia Motley more than once. It's not a new thing. This country has been lucky because it has had this rich tradition of politicians setting a course, staying the course. And you can say that for the Barbados Labour Party. You can say it even for the Democratic Labour Party up until 2008. Okay. Something happened, and I'll come to that. I left here when I was 17, I went to university, I came back during university, during my working life, and you could see this rich tradition 
in the physical geography and the physical assets in this country. In this parish alone, since I left, came back, visited, there's a polyclinic, there's a police station. You go down to Lower Estate, that's an industrial hub down there now. These are all things when I was a boy that weren't there. And they point to this tradition. They point to politicians generation after generation plotting a course. When we talk about this course, it's not new. It's the same course that we've had that dates all the way back to the plantation and slavery. It's a course of social and economic transformation. It's a course that no matter which government has come to power, they assign a set of policies designed to overcome some of the historical wrongs that we know have existed in this country. David Ellis was mentioned a moment ago by Tyrone Lovell and Brass Tax. I can remember an interview he gave with my father, 1981 or 1982, long before there was a rocking chair for retirement waiting for Mr. Ellis. And one of the things my father said in that interview was that any conceivable government in this country will aim to uplift the poor. All governments will try to increase the size of the economic pie. But if there was any disproportion in that increase, it must go to the poor. Any conceivable government had to aim for that. Now something happened between 2008 and 2018 and that rich tradition that both sides practiced was forgotten. I saw Glenn Clark up here talking about tuition fees. Of all the things that happened between 2008 and 18, if there was one thing that stood out above everything else that said we were not going forward anymore, we hadn't even stopped. We had turned around and were running backwards down the alleyway of history when we start to impose tuition fees on young people trying to attend university in this country. I was abroad at the time, but I looked at that, along with all the other economic disaster that was unfolding, and I thought, wow, there is a serious catastrophe coming to Barbados. We're approaching a precipice. If we fall over that, it's not going to be easy to come back. I'd known Mia Motley for a long time, and we had speak intermittently in that period. And around 2016, 17, she said, are you thinking about coming back? I said, yeah. And I came back here. But I wouldn't have come back just for that disaster. I wanted to come and do something to help. Not elective politics, but I wanted to do something. But I wouldn't have come back if I hadn't seen that in Mia Motley, we have, at that time, a potential prime minister, and now we have prime minister, who is likely to stand with the best prime ministers this country has ever had. <laughs> 10 years in opposition, 10 difficult years. You remember that? That wasn't easy. She took a fractured party and unified it. You think that is easy? She took 10 years and prepared a path for government. She assembled a strong team. She crafted the right policies to get us out of the disaster that was unfolding, especially in the second half of that 2008-2018 period. When I saw that and she said, come, that's easy to say yes. That's a Barbadian answer, not a Barbados Labour Party answer. You want to come, you want to rebuild this country and put it back on the path to prosperity. So I came. It's an honor to serve in the Senate, and one I do with pleasure. But that is not the same thing as standing up here and speaking on a platform. This is the front line of politics. Why did I want to do that? What really drove me to do that is I looked at the debate that's unfolding in this by-election. And on one side, there's a lot of noise. A lot of people making a lot of noise and not saying a great deal. You know, it's like a soda bits biscuit. You know, you like it, but there's not a lot of substance there. You know? And on the other side, and this was where I was afraid, on the other side, I saw all the things that motivated me to come back to Barbados. A solid team, an amazing prime minister, 
someone with the ability to persuade and bind a team and recruit strong candidates. Candidates able to stay the course that she has plotted to take this country back from the abyss that it was looking down into. So I stand here for one of those candidates tonight, and that's Tony Moore. You think it's easy to be become the head of the Barbados Workers' Union if you're a woman? This is a man's world, it said. You've got a lady who's done that. And you know, I passed this sign on the highway the other day. Some hotel, I think I put it up. It said, proven, not promised. And I thought of Tony Moore. You're already looking at someone as a union leader who is proven, not promised. And by trying to come to the lower house of parliament, she's extending a process that began with the social partnership back in the 1990s, a partnership also formed in a crisis designed to bring us back from the brink. It's a natural evolution. It strengthens and deepens that process. Now, I sat in the Senate with Toni Moore, and already I knew who she was when she first arrived. Proven, not promised. In the Senate, up close, I can tell you, without fear of contradiction whatsoever, this is a friend of labor. Irrevocably so, that is never going to change. And I can say that because of what I've seen her say in the Senate. She always speaks logically and with reason. She's sincere and she speaks with passion. Not hysteria. We have others in the Senate who speak with hysteria. But she is not one of them. If there was one speech that she gave in the Senate, and this is all on YouTube, but if there was one speech she gave that showed me those qualities in abundance, it was in June when she spoke on the severance payments amendment bill. Listen, on top of those qualities, she took the government to task on that bill. She explained why the timing was poor. She explained the difficulties that Labour was having. And she set out, her, set out her case with logic, with reason, and with passion. And in doing all of that, she did something else. I heard one person mention it tonight. She spoke the truth to power. And she spoke on behalf of Labour. That's a rare thing, you know. It's easy to find yes people and yes men. That's not who Tony Moore is. I've seen it, and I think many people tonight here have seen it if they've been following this campaign. Tony Moore has already shown in the way she has canvassed this constituency that she's a people-centered person, that she's driven, that she wants to make a difference and a big difference. You know, I heard her say, I think yesterday or two days ago, she set herself the goal of knocking on every door of every house in this constituency. Does that sound to you like somebody who is complacent? No, that's somebody who cares and is driven and wants to make a difference. They haven't waited for nomination day to start that work. She's been at it a long time. And she's tired, but she's still going. The Prime Minister chose a fantastic candidate to carry on the mission. And it took a lot for me to come up here tonight to talk about it. But when I hear the noise, the sort of big politics from the other side. It, it is important not to forget where we were just three years ago. It's important not to be distracted, not to be diluted in our effort, and not to be corrupted away from this path that's been charted. It's critical. Now I can say all these wonderful things about Toni Moore because I've also seen next to her highlights some of the low lights in the Senate. And I haven't come up here to be some kind of butcher or anything, but it's worth pointing out that we have an opposition in the Senate that contradicts itself, that is incoherent at times, and has no policies, no serious policies 
to offer. You know, we had a bill come, the boss bill, you probably remember this. This granted civil servants the chance to put aside some of their salary into a savings scheme that paid 5%. You know, the only time you can see 5% in this country is if you are a borrower, not a saver. 5%. In that debate, we had one of the opposition senators stand up and say, this is money printing. Within the hour, the other senator stood up and said, no, this is contractionary, which is the diametric opposite of money printing. How is it? You cannot, in a debate, settle the line you're going to take. Two people, you know, before the debate starts. Are these the kind of representatives that you want to see in Parliament? I ask you, you want that? The debate on integrity and public life. We heard the leader of the opposition in the Senate say that it was too intrusive. It didn't need to cover civil servants or the public sector. You only had to cover the 30 who are in the House of Assembly because if there's any corruption, he said, it's going to come from there. Leave the public sector alone. Okay. Two, three weeks later, we have the public service bill. The same senator stands up. This time he's recounting a litany of malfeasance and corruption and misdoing, wrongdoing, in the public sector by civil servants. How can this be? One week, there's no problem in the civil service. Integrity doesn't matter. Next week, oh my God, the place is rotten with corruption. And so it goes on and on and on. They say one thing, they contradict themselves literally moments later. I saw yesterday the, the PDP or the PPDDP, whatever they're calling themselves, I got to say that because when I look at their logo, there's a P, there's a P, there's a capital D, and there's a small D. I don't know which out of democracy and development is the small D, but anyway. They said they're going to participate, then they're not going to participate. So the choice for you should be clear. You have a serious candidate who, along with the Prime Minister, has told the world, we want to be a serious country again. Rich tradition, serious administrators. And on the other side, well, you don't have that. And come the 11th of November, you can send two messages. You can tell the government, we're still with you. Two and a half years ago, 30 love. That's a lot of solidarity. That's a lot of faith to stay the course. If you don't turn out in numbers to say that again, we're going to wonder. You need to come out. You need to vote. It's not a foregone conclusion. And you can send another message, and this is a message to the opposition. And it's a message that's very important for our democracy. The cupboard of your ideas and policies is empty. It's bare. It's bereft. There is nothing in it. Once again, go away. Rejuvenate yourselves. Develop some policies and ideas, because the country needs that. Even the government needs that. If our democracy is to thrive, it's because there's a competition of ideas. Go back and craft these ideas and stop trying to distract everybody. People of St. George North, vote Tony Moore. Vote the BLP and vote for the government. Stay the course. Thank you and good night.